professor here for a number of years, God knows how long, and um, I'm chair of my department, which is Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences at UCSF. Um, I have been, my research is in personalized medicine, so I'll, I'll talk to you about that today, and, and my hope is, is that it will stimulate, what I say will stimulate some of you to think about this kind of research as you go forward in your career. Um, so um, this just shows kind of the spectrum of research starting from basic to patient care. And, um, and personalized medicine, you can find a niche anywhere along this spectrum. So we tend to work in the basic to clinical in this kind of region. Um, we're not doing patient care, but our work, work hopefully has good implications to patient care. So this is one thing that I like to say about personalized medicine. You can find it along this spectrum. You can find something you'd be interested um, in doing. Um, so today I'm going to talk about three things. I'll talk about our pharmacogenomic studies, and I'll try to make it broadly, you know, impactful to what I hope you might be doing. Um, and just want to get a feeling. I mean, can I ask them? Yeah, so just a few questions. You should ask lots of questions. Okay, yeah, let me ask you guys away. So, um, most of you are medical students, and my son did this also. He took off between his <coughs> second and third year, and then he stayed longer and did his PhD and get, did then went back and did everything. But anyway, so you guys are taking up one year doing uh, research, and can it be, are you on HHMI fellowships, or you, is it CTSI? Has CTSI, it and there's some doors you put in on here. And are you in subspecialty research or basic research? Well, I guess I should ask, who is doing like subspecialty kind of research, like like the one talking just for like pulmonary or you know you take that I don't know what to call that and then the more what are they like more more general medicine kind of research not really and basic is anybody like in the lab actually doing sort of experiments and how many of you have patient cohorts working with different patients okay all right, so chime in and tell me what you do when you ask questions so that I kind of get a feel. But, okay, so I'll talk about our pharmacogenomic studies. And one is in the diabetes area, and the other is in the, um, I guess, arthritis area, all up here and all. Um, and then I'm going to talk about transport-mediated drug-drug interactions. And finally, I have a startup company that I started a few years ago with some of my students and postdocs, and that's been very fun. And I thought I'd tell you a little, and it's focused on personalized medicine. Um, so I'm going to just tell you about that because um, I think it's a good way to, you know, really translate your research into something very useful. So I'll tell you about that at the end. Okay, so I'll start with the pharmacogenomic you know, um, studies and disease interactions. Um, so metformin, I think you all know, it's an anti-diabetic drug. It's now like one of the world's most highly prescribed drugs. Um, it, uh, there's large variation response to metformin. It's first-line therapy for type 2 diabetes, but if you give it to people, you know, about 35% of them will not achieve acceptable glycemic control, and you have to add another drug, take them off metformin, et cetera. So we've been interested in the factors that contribute to that variation in response, and, and we've been interested in genetic factors. Why we're particularly interested in metformin, because I come at this from a, um, you know, from a laboratory or basic research is that my lab is really focused on transporters, membrane transporters. Metformin is highly transported. It's very polar, it's not metabolized, it's just used as a transporter. So that's what got us into the whole area. Now we're well beyond transporters here, but uh, we got into the area for that reason. Um, it exerts a lot of its anti-diabetic drugs in the liver and there's some transporters there that I'll mention. It's also now being touted, as many of you may know, it's in clinical trials as a super drug for cancer, tumor prevention, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, a number of different cancers. They're giving metformin now the way they give tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors if after a woman has uh, her tumor and has it removed. Um, they put her on metformin to prevent tumor recurrence in clinical trials. So it's also got a whole spectrum of activities that appear to be very beneficial in a lot of different diseases. And exactly how it works, that's also something my lab studies, um, that's basic pharmacology, I won't be talking about that today. Okay, um, so we have a very integrated approach to our study. We do do patients, um, we do healthy volunteers, we do mouse studies, we do in vitro studies, so we take a very integrated approach. We have a wonderful healthy volunteer population we've accrued over the last 
10 years. They've given us their DNA. They're here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We, uh, we advertise on Craigslist. They give us their DNA and they agree to come in for drug studies into the CRC where we can do um, some studies on them if we like. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we use these people to really get at the mechanism of how a SNP or a genetic variant may work. And then, of course, we have diabetic populations, which I'll describe in a second. So um, these are some of the populations we have. So we have over 100 healthy volunteers that we have given metformin to, and we have intensely measured drug levels glucose levels, insulin levels, we've really got intense phenotypes on these people. So if we discover a genetic variant, we can, like in the real patients, these are healthy volunteers, we discover a genetic variant that associates with response to metformin, we can go back to our healthy volunteer and ask, did that genetic variant change the pharmacokinetics of metformin? Because we can just genotype these people, actually we have genotype and they can run them all on GWAS chips, so we you know that. Um, so we also have a healthy, well, I mean a diabetic population, European and Asian, and then we have the largest cohort now of African American diabetic patients on uh, metformin with EMR um, data. So to do all this, I collaborate with a lot of people, and I'll mention those people as we go. Um, so here's one of the really nice results we've gotten. So we've done a GWAS, um, and we've used our we're doing a genome-wide association study in our African Americans, and um, this is our um, European population that we've done first, and we've got a, a hip pair um, on chromosome 9, um, and so that's very interesting to us, and so what we're now trying to do is replicate it. We've got another whole patient population from Northwestern, we called up a bunch of people, that's one thing fun about this, is that you know, you're interacting with an international community as you carry on your science because there's all this ethnic differences and different people have different uh, patient populations. So, so we're replicating this, seeing if we can replicate it. Um, and then, of course, we're very interested in, well, well, how does that influence, how does that gene that's on that chromosome or those genes influence the response to that form? And so we move this back into the laboratory and, and perform very basic methods. So um, I like these studies. I'm just going to tell you my personal feeling for these <coughs> studies as you get develop sort of research taste. My personal feeling is I like them because they're discovery oriented. Um, I'm I, I'm not a statistician, um, so I eat so I you know so a statistical result is a very unsatisfactory result for me. I mean I'm ha happy to see the p values. You're going to see even better p values that are very nice, but I really want to know the mechanism for how this is working. That's just how I think. So I bring it to my laboratory and, and we start you know, thinking about how to explore that mechanism. And I'm always thinking of how we can discover or modulate therapy, um, how we can discover a new drug, how, um, so that's always in the back of my mind uh, as well. Um, so here is a, a membrane transporter, so the secondary structure of a membrane transporter. Um, that controls metformin entry into the liver. This is how metformin gets into the liver by this transporter called organic cation transporter one off one. And these are genetic variants that we discovered many years ago that are non synonymous this, this transport is very unique and it has a number of non synonymous variants that are pretty common. So what we did, and including one deletion there, what we did was we used cytric immunogenesis we created each one of these variant OCT1 transporters and we put them in cells. And we tested how they take up metformin. So here is a cell, with HEK cells I believe, and here's metformin uptake by the OCT1 <coughs> transporter. And you can see it takes it up quite a lot. And then these variants, a whole bunch of them you can see, don't work at all. They're totally non-functional. So, um, so of course we asked the question, how if these people can't get metformin into their liver very well, we would presume they may not respond to the drug very well. So that was our very hot hypothesis. And we could uh, test this in, um, in uh, a small patient cohort. So we did. We recruited the people. And we could ask whether it would affect the pharmacokinetics by doing a very intense study or the pharmacodynamics by looking at the glucose levels. Uh, that just shows much so here are um, people with the variants. I think we recruited about 20 
of people with the variant, and they had a little, and these are the plasma concentrations of metformin versus time. And people with the variant had a little higher concentration than the people without, not, not, nothing to write home about. It was significant at the early time points, but not a big difference. And you would have expected, well, then they might respond better. But our hypothesis is if you have that variant, and you don't take metformin up, doesn't get into your liver, you're going to respond worse. So in, we did a glucose tolerance test, and indeed the people with the variants had higher glucose levels than the people without the variants. So that was a very nice study, and when we first got this naively, 2007, we published that, we thought, well, this, this transporter with all those non-synonymous variants is going to play a big role in response to metformin and in contributing to variation in response to metformin. And it's, those variants are very common. I mean, that allele frequency of that um, uh, deletion is 20%, so they're very common. So we thought it's going to come up, but it has, did not come up in that genome-wide association study. There's been one other GWAS published in the literature. Octolon does not come up. So there are other things that are probably, and that's kind of how we moved from transporters to let's just look at what else influences metformin response, and we'll use the GWAS to kind of inform our mechanism. Okay, questions? Okay, so I guess what, from your point of view, I mean, again, depending on what kind of literature, what kind of area you're doing, um, you know, from my point of view, you can do studies in whole population, so you can tend studies in our GPRT are really nice, really pro clinical mechanism, um, and, um, and, and understand genetic variation. I'm going to skip that one and go to, um, Allopurinol. So um, now, I don't know, did Neil Rich talk in this group? And Kathy Schaefer? And have anybody from the RPGH cohort talked? Okay. Do, do you guys know what the RPGH cohort is? So, so what Neil did a few years ago, he's had a few human genetics here. Um, he and Kathy Schaefer, who's at Kaiser Northern California, they said, you know, let's get ahead of the curve here, and let's just, because we have a great EMR, Kaiser Northern California really does, and let's start collecting DNA from lots of people. So they collected 100,000 DNA samples, they're up to 200 now, from any patient. They sent out letters to everybody, collected 100,000 DNA samples through saliva, and then they ran GWAS on every single one of them. So they now have genome-wide. So any one of you, you should get Neil to talk, because I, and no matter what you're doing, that cohort can be very interesting to you, because it has all their EMR. It would have asthma, for example. It would have drug response in asthma. They've already run the genotype. So we thought, you know, if we could just get a foot in that door. So, um, so we, you can write uh, an application. It's onerous you can write it, to get access to those samples. So I had a student, um, Chris Wen, shown here, he's a bioinformatics student, so he, he, he was very persevering, wrote that application, and, uh, and we were very interested in, um, in uh, allopurinol, and I'll tell you why. And we're interested, in, again, we're a transporter lab, so uh, gout is, you know, in, is um, caused by high uric acid levels, and um, so most species, not humans or other primates, have this enzyme, uricase. So uricase takes uric acid, breaks it down into very hydrophilic metabolites. And those hydrophilic metabolites are very soluble and they wouldn't precipitate out in any joint. But we lost uric uricase um, about 15 million years ago in evolution. We and some of our primate cousins lost it. Um, and so our end product is uric acid, which now is not metabolized, so it's highly transported. So we were very interested in, um, in um, what are the genetic determinants of uric acid levels, because we're behind the curve there, a lot of people already did that study, and then what are the genetic determinants of response to, um, and then we picked allopurinol because that's the primary um, drug used. So um, let me just tell you, so when we got, the, when we got our application, uh, approved, um, they we, we had access to anyone with a uric acid level in their EMR. So there are 32,000 of these 100,000 who had already undergone GWAS had a uric acid level. Um, and they'd already done undergone with GWAS. And then um, we, we started with the Europeans, although we are very interested in pursuing beyond that. And there were 26,000, so you can see it's largely a European <coughs> cohort, okay, but there are other ethnic groups. And they are actually substantial numbers. I mean, 26,000 is like unheard of. They've already been GWAS. 
And then we took out drug people who are on uric acerics or drugs that affect uric acid levels so that we could just say, what are the genetic determinants of uric acid um, levels? So now we're going to associate uric acid levels. Oh, we took the first uric acid level they had ever had, because some of them, you know, there's longitudinal. These people have been in Kaiser for years. So we decide, well, when they get old, I mean, their kidney function might change. Who knows? Let's just figure out what are the genetic determinants of just their baseline uric acid. So we took the first one they ever had measured in their life, which usually might, might have been for many of them in their 20s. Um, so we took that, and we associated it with each one of these SNPs. And so this is what you're looking at again. Um, you're looking at the, and I didn't explain the Manhattan plot, but anyway, this is the mind. Do they, does everyone know the Manhattan plot? And I already showed it, so but I'll just <laughs> say this. Uh, so this is the p-value. Uh, the higher the number, because it's done as a minus log p-value, the higher the number, the better the p-value. And what you're looking at is the association, the p-value for association of 600,000 SNPs with uric acid level. And you can see none of them, a whole bunch of them are just in the noise, in the wheat. But we got this huge hit, 10 to the minus 146. It's a transporter. Um, others have found it before. I would love to claim we were the first. It's a transporter. It's a transporter no one knew was a uric acid transporter. This is a glute. See the name glute. Everybody thought it was a glucose transporter. As soon as they found this in the human genetic studies, they put it into cells. They found out it's a better uric acid transporter than a glucose transporter. So we learned a lot of human biology from gene genome-wide association studies. Um, and then the hot next highest hit, another transporter. This transporter is called breast cancer resistance protein. So you can imagine what everybody thought it did. It pushed out anti-cancer um, drugs from tumors. So it's like fetal protein or multi-drug resistance protein. Um, so they said, oh, let's transport uric acid. Sure enough, they put uric acid into the cells. This is a very good uric acid transporter, so we discovered that. And then a couple others, they're all, every, all the high hits are uric acid transporters. This was the only known one, uric one, uric acid transporter. Everything else was not meant to be a uric acid transporter. So there was a lot of power in learning about human biology here. So what we're going to do now, so unfortunately, although these are very high quality, we've even <coughs> indicated, you know, we, we can see what other things might be there. We've got even better p-values. But um, what we're going to do now is focus on some ethnic populations that we have that nobody's looked at yet. So nobody's ever looked at genetic determinants of uric acid level in Hispanics. So we're going to look at Hispanics. Um, and then, of course, um, we're very interested in allopurinol response. So we've already done that association. With, we've got before allopurinol uric acid levels and after allopurinol uric acid levels. So we can see what allopurinol does and how it Some people, they really respond. Their uric acid levels go down, and there are a whole bunch of people that don't respond. So we're looking for that, and we've got a really nice hit. So we're now pursuing that, and uh, we'll see. We have to replicate it. And, do all of that, but it's a very interesting, it's actually made us now think that the mechanism that allopurinol works as a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, that I'm not saying that that's not true, but there may be other mechanisms that are contributing. So it's contributed also to our fundamental knowledge of pharmacology, perhaps, if we can prove some of these other mechanisms. So we're busy in the lab uh, doing that um, study, but um, this has been an exceptional resource, and I just really feel you should get Neil in here, and everybody should ask him questions to how to get access to those samples. <coughs> they only really have the EMR, and they have the DNA, but they also have tel telomeres, because Liz Blackburn was also uh, collaborating, so they've got telomeres on those people, but still, it's quite a, quite a great opportunity. Okay, questions on that. Yes? Yeah, this may be, uh, just me not understanding it well, but you said you excluded anyone who'd been on a a uric acid lowering drug, and if you're taking the first measurement that they had in the Kaiser system, I mean, couldn't a lot of those first measurements have been before they were on those drugs? Yeah. And you could have used like sort of the delta to see. Yes. So, so I didn't go into those things. So Neil <laughs> kind of, you know, because we're doing these things on our own, but Neil is real, you know, Rich is really out kind of collaborating with us, and he knows. He said, "Don't exclude those people. Just right. put them all back in and see what happens." Well, I thought it would screw up our p-value because they're on uric acid lowering drugs, and he would say. But we did take the first one. So when we added them back, we gained a lot of power and our key values actually did go up. This is a very good point. Okay. Neil would have been faster with you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, 
And we get a lot of, you know, we can do a lot of discovery. Because now, once you get approved for a certain group of patients, you can you can do a lot of studies with it. So we're also trying to collaborate with Lindsay because we're on people who actually know about gout. Because the, the genetic determinants of uric acid do not are not the genetic determinants of gout. The gout might be that you know you you know you've got some other things going on. You get more inflammation. Maybe you've got less water volume and other things that can go on. Um, Okay, I'll go quickly through this because this is probably of less interest to you. Um, but um, so one of the things I like to do um, is um, so a lot of the work that we do has um, some influence on how people develop drugs, and um, and uh, so we, we're very interested in thinking with the FDA um, uh, and and how they regulate. So what, this whole area, this whole new area, I went to a report called regulatory science. And they've talked about expanding the workforce for regulatory sciences. And so we're very interested that our transporters are very important um, in mediating drug-drug interaction. Because two drugs can interact with the transporter, prevent the drug from getting into the liver, the drug won't be metabolized, up go the drug levels, up goes the toxicity. So FDA is very interested in transporter-mediated drug-drug interactions. So we formed an international consortium. And the way we did it was we formed it with, um, and it's on transport. And it, we formed it with in industry guys, academics, and FDA guys. And the idea was, because the industry was being too overregulated, FDA, as you know, can overregulate, you know, they're very conservative and they can overregulate. So they were making industry guys to have these clinical studies on their new drugs. Um, for drug-drug interactions with transporters based on like some in vitro study that may not be very informative. So we decided we would all get together and we'd spend a lot of time thinking about and reading literature about what drugs, how you should do these <coughs> studies, and when you should kick off a clinical study. Um, so we got this group together. Um, oh, and here's a typical, this will be in an FDA, if you go to FDA's website, they have this FDA guidance. You'll see they have a guidance on drug-drug interactions. So, um, so they tell you what to do. If this happens in vitro, you do this, and then you do this, and here you have to do a clinical study to get all these yeses. Um, and the criteria for doing a clinical study was very poor, so we thought we could improve that, and we did, by writing some papers. But one thing that was clear to me um, is that we don't really know a lot about drug-drug interactions, because you know, people, you, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you get, well, you're probably too junior now, but you, soon you'll be getting all these drug alerts, you know, oh, your, your drug's going to interact with another drug and you're going to be sick of them. And so you're, gonna get, you're not going to even look at them. You don't know which ones are meaningful and which ones are not. So we really thought that what we could do is, um, you know, try to find other drugs that actually may cause substantial drug-drug interactions. Um, this is the FDA guidance that came out after we worked work together with them. Um, but anyway, I'm going to move on. So um, what we did was we took a prescription drug library. I don't know how many of you have access or think about, but we have a small molecule discovery center here at Mission Bay. And um, so and they have libraries. It doesn't really even cost. I think this <coughs> cost me $3,000. I mean, it's really nothing to do this prescription drug library screen. So we screened against a transporter that the FDA has their eye on that causes drug-drug interactions in the kidney. This transporter is involved in active secretion of metformin. And so if you inhibit that transporter, it, metformin can't get eliminated. You get higher metformin levels and presumably you're more at risk for toxicity. So, um, so we screened the prescription drug library and the idea was we were going to find um, new prescription drugs that may interact with this transporter and cause that problem. Um, and so we did that and we set up a fluorescent assay and we screened about a thousand drugs actually when we added other things. And we found a bunch of drugs, 84 inhibitors out of that, uh, that would really inhibit at a good concentration. And then we compare those concentrations to the clinical concentrations of the drug. It doesn't matter if it inhibits in vitro at 10 micromolar, if the drug is present in the plasma at one nanomolar, it's not going to inhibit. So we simply, you know, we, we have a whole, my, guy, my guys have put together a really nice spreadsheet showing the clinically relevant concentration. So now I have guys in my lab, a PharmD student, who's very interested in testing these clinical, these drugs and whether they actually will cause a drug-drug interaction. 
So we've recruited our normal, our healthy volunteers. Um, and I'm just going to go show you that one of, not this, this is one of the drugs. So Famotidine, H2 receptor antagonist. It's a very potent inhibitor of this metformin kidney transporter, MATE1. It inhibits it selectively over other transporters. So we've given famotidine and metformin. Nobody ever thought that would cause a drug drug interaction. And that's what she's involved in doing. And um, we recruited 12 healthy volunteers. We gave them metformin alone, famotidine alone, metformin plus famotidine. Um, and I'm, I'm, I can't show you the results because we don't have them yet. I can only tell you that what we do have is a biomarker for that famotidine is inhibiting that transporter. So that transporter also secretes creatinine. <coughs> So before famotidine, here's your creatinine levels. And then one hour after famotidine, um, the creatinine levels go up because it's being actively secreted by this. So we think that we did get famotidine inhibiting that transport. Now we're going to look at metformin pharmacokinetics before and after famotidine. So that's kind of an interesting, that's another area that we look at is drug-drug interactions because some of them might be important. I don't know how it's going to be there. Okay, questions on this? I'm moving now to the um, last part of my talk. So this is the startup company. Um, so, you know, for years I've been in the university and I would just really want everybody to be thinking, of, 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 if I had one regret is that I should have done a startup company sooner. Because, you know, you can, a lot of times we would discover things and we'd publish it and we think, well, it's going to impact anyone. Well, never impact anybody. I mean, the other people would read it and they'd publish a paper and we all kept publishing papers, but no new drugs, nothing happened. And I, and so in around 2007 or 8, um, I brought a chemist into my lab because these, we study influx transporters. And it became clear to me that a lot of influx transporters are overexpressed in tumors. And if you could take anti-cancer drugs and instead of just give these horrible anti-cancer drugs that go everywhere and nobody wants to take and target them. So we synthesized, she did, you know, a number of targeted anti-cancer drugs. And the frustration for me was we synthesized it, we, we, sh we tested them in the lab, we did a disclosure for, for the university, you, you disclose new inventions, so we disclosed it, and we waited patiently for the university to license our compounds so that some pharmaceutical company would develop the drugs. But of course, nobody licensed it. And I would call them and say, you know, are you doing anything to try to get this? And they wouldn't. And so finally, I just made a New Year's resolution that I'm going to start my own company. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, I, and I did, and with my students and postdocs. And we all started our own company. Um, and it's been really, I think, a fun thing. So here's this button. Um, 